every day pon, every time is pon. Merry go round, no di tai no. Every day pon. Oh hey, didn't see you there. I was just listening to the new Foo Fighters single. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot more experimental than their old stuff. Of course, old is a relative term. When I say old stuff, I'm talking about Foo Fighters songs from the mid to late 1990s. These songs are older than I am, but on the scale of rock music as a whole, they're actually pretty modern. I would argue that an album like The Color and the Shape is a bit too recent to be considered a classic just yet. Nirvana's In Utero, on the other hand, is most likely a classic because not only is it a very high quality, it was part of the grunge movement. As well remembered as that movement is, I'd say it's still very dated and retro. Still, even that album is on the cusp of being a classic. What if we were to go even further through the history of rock and metal? We could dive into some classic Iron Maiden, Metallica, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, heck, even the Rolling Stones. As a teenager of today, I've hardly dipped my toes into this pool, much less taken the time to swim a few laps. What would I think of something like Led Zeppelin when I listen to bands that play styles that were impossible when they were around? Bands like Melt Banana or Icy Stars. This is why I've decided to start a new series that I call Newbie Reviews. In this series, I will visit these historical landmarks of the music world and offer my thoughts from a fresh perspective. In critiquing these albums, I will have no regard for historical context, no regard for nostalgia, and no regard for the influence these albums may have had on later works. The only thing I will regard is the music itself. My goal here is to see how today's youth can appreciate these classics, as well as how well they hold up after all these years. If I think an album is great, I can introduce younger viewers to it with my review. If I don't think it's that great, I can use the review to offer an alternative perspective to people who basically hail it as a sacred cow. I won't say that they're wrong or try to keep them from liking it, but I do want to show that no work in any medium is really objectively good or bad. With all that in mind, it's time to review our first classic album. Rush is a Canadian progressive rock band that has established itself as one of the biggest names in the genre. Even though their early work is considered derivative of bands like Led Zeppelin, they eventually developed their own unique sound and became known for their creative songwriting and technical skill. I first heard of Rush when I found their song YYZ on the game Guitar Hero 2, which my parents and I used to play religiously when I was little. Even though I liked the song, I was only a casual rock fan at the time, so I never got myself into the band. After that, Rush was a name that sort of lingered in the background of my life for many years, until I finally heard their song Tom Sawyer and was compelled to check out a full album from them. What I found was an interesting gem that was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It isn't perfectly cut, but it has a glimmering luster to it that gives it a sort of imperfect beauty. It's played with rock instruments, it sounds like rock music, but something's really different about it. Like I said, it's progressive rock, but that's a very diverse subgenre. The only way for me to really help you understand just how this sounds, without just playing the whole thing for you and basically being a pirate, is to go more in depth. First, I will start with the big picture. The songs mostly use guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. There are frequent synthesizer parts which really help add to the songs and make them feel more colorful. You will also find a few well-placed sound effects here and there. Since this album is more than 30 years old, the instruments don't have those really full, meaty tones that the instruments on most modern albums have. While they can feel a bit shallow at times, they still do a pretty good job of carrying the songs overall. Moving Pictures was released in the early 1980s. One thing that I've noticed about AB's music is that a lot of artists and producers were getting pretty creative with the effects they were using to keep things interesting. While this made certain songs sound like they were performed in a tin can, at least in my opinion, the songs on moving pictures are simply enhanced. Everything has a sort of mechanical and futuristic feel, and the creative use of synthesizers really helps sell that feeling. Alex Lyson's guitar tone is just heavy enough to be suitable for hard rock. He's very talented, showing off a very queer competence on his instrument. However, he's also my least favorite, mostly for his tendency to make his guitar shriek during solos. Mm -hmm. 
Geddy Lee is known for his unique falsetto vocals, and this album showcases them wonderfully. He, he manages to avoid making um, unpleasant noises despite his shrill and atypical vocal style, and he ends up just sounding very unique and cool. His bass lines are great too. They're prominent in the songs and have this nice crunchy tone. Also, like any great bassist, he manages to avoid overpowering the songs and instead just enhances them perfectly from within his niche. His bass lines are definitely busy, and he can lock in perfectly with the guitar or the drums at various points during the songs. Finally, Neil Peart's drumming pulls everything together. Like Geddy Lee's bass playing, Peart's drumming is not overpowering, but he definitely does whatever he can to enhance the songs. He's obviously a master of his instrument, always keeping his drumming uh, dynamic, energetic, complex, and diverse. Well, diverse except for this one type of fill he keeps doing for some reason. Still, it's clear that he has talent, so I'm gonna give him a break for that. It's definitely no surprise that he's considered one of the greatest drummers out there. Now it's time to see how all these different styles affect the individual songs on Moving Pictures, starting with Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer is a catchy, energetic opener that effectively sets the album's tone. In other words, it does everything that an opening song should do. It contains a very catchy synth lead and an interesting atmosphere. The guitar solo is okay, though it does contain some of that shrieking I talked about earlier. I can't really say much else about the song except that it's very well done and it deserves an 8 out of 10. I strip away the Up next is Red Barchetta. It's more upbeat than the last song, and it's even catchier in my opinion. It's six minutes long, but that six minutes feels like four just because of how tightly written everything is. There's not one dull moment in the song. Everything is bright and colorful, there are great performances from every member of the band, and the production tricks act as a nice amount of seasoning just to make sure that everything sounds as good as it can. Okay, now, I don't usually care that much about the lyrics of songs, but the message in Red Barchetta cannot be ignored. It tells the story of a young man living in a future where many motor vehicles have been outlawed. On Sundays, he goes over to his uncle's place and takes secret rides in the country in an old, now illegal, Barchetta. In his descriptions of the vehicle and the experience of driving and riding in it, Getty Lee effectively provokes feelings of intense excitement and nostalgia. Using a scenario in which old vehicles have become more precious than ever, Red Barchetta is capable of bringing out the gearhead in all of us. If it weren't for the fact that it had some of the minor issues that plagued the album as a whole, such as a slight lack of fullness from the instruments and a bit of guitar shrieking, I would give it a perfect score. Regardless, Red Barchetta is easily worth a 9 out of 10, and it has the honor of being my favorite song off of Moving Pictures. Still, Red Barchetta is not the only awesome song on this album. YYZ is a refreshing change of pace. It's completely instrumental, and the ways in which the different instruments are used are arguably more creative than in any other song off this album. It starts off with a very interesting rhythm, which sounds like this. It spells out YYZ in Morse code, which is the identification code of the Toronto Pearson International Airport. This is actually a well-known fact among Rush fans, because YYZ is one of Rush's most famous songs, and honestly, I'm not surprised. Between the colorful chord progressions, changes in instrumentation, energetic tone, tight performances, guitar solo that's actually free of shrieking this time around, and all-around infectious melodies, this song easily earns its 9 out of 10 rating. Unfortunately, Limelight brings this string of stellar songs to an end. At least for me it does. Most Rush fans actually really like this song, and I'm okay with that, but I don't see what's so great about it. My mom listens to a bit of Rush, and she says she really likes the lyrics of this song. Now, I, like I said, I'm not really into lyrical messages, but I'll try to look at this objectively. Neil Peart wrote this song because he was uncomfortable with his fame and how much unwanted attention he and the band had been getting at the time. And I do think it is really important to remind people that fame isn't as glamorous as it looks, and I don't have any problem with how the song did it, but it's hardly a new theme. 
The music itself is what really determines the value of this song. Overall, it's um, half decent. Okay, I will give it this. It is a well-written song with a sound that's distinctly rushed, but still different from the other songs on the album. It's kind of hard to describe the style of Limelight, but let's just say it's much more easygoing than the other songs, lacking the blistering speed of YYZ, the brightness of Red Barchetta, or the futuristic feel of Tom Sawyer. The main problem with Limelight is that none of these qualities are really replaced with anything compelling. The vocals are fairly well written, but not a single line is liable to get stuck on my head. Aside from a completely underwhelming guitar solo, the instruments just do a half-decent job of backing the half-decent vocals, preaching a half-decent message. Limelight is just a half-decent song, and on my rating system, that translates to a 6 out of 10. Thankfully, this album immediately gets back on track with a catchy, creative, 11-minute long epic titled The Camera Eye. This song contains the finest synthesizer sections in the entire album, hands down. It even opens with one of these cool sections, which I used in the transition screen. After the rock instruments start joining in, there's a brief transition before everything starts to sound more like a typical upbeat Rush song, especially Red Barchetta. However, this song doesn't really lose its unique tinge. Another interesting thing to note is that it progresses a bit more slowly than a song like Red Barchetta, yet there's just enough progression to justify the song's long runtime. It would take a while to explain every twist and turn that the song goes through, and I would rather not spoil them all for you, so I'll just leave it at this. The Camera Eye is an epic song. It makes great use of its runtime by using it to deliver tons of catchy and creative moments to listeners. It continues Rush's bold experimentation, and I would argue that it raises the bar even higher than it was before. This is why it gets a 9 out of 10 from me. Now that we've gotten back to the really good part of the album, I bet the next song is going to be just as good. Um, let's see, what was that song named again? Um, um... Oh, here it is, Witch Hunt. You know, that sounds like a song with a strong message against irrational fear, mob mentality, and assuming the worst in people. The night is black without a moon. Yeah. Well, it definitely has that. Unfortunately, everything else is pretty underwhelming. It falls into many of the same traps that Limelight does. The instrumental is pretty good, and I would argue that it's even slightly better than Limelight due to its dark tone, which I could only describe as... Spooky. However, there aren't a lot of great instrumental moments, and that, coupled with a slow pace, causes the song to lose its novelty as it drags on. The vocal melodies are fairly catchy, just like the ones in Limelight, but again, they don't really stick with me. I'm going to give Witch Hunt a 7 out of 10, because while it has many of the same problems that Limelight does, the tone and the message of the song are both somewhat stronger. Vital Signs is the last song on this album. That means it's gonna go out with a bang, right? <laughs> Wrong. Vital Signs is the lowest note that this album could have possibly ended on. Note that I say that this album couldn't have ended on a lower note. I'm sure that there are albums from terrible bands that have had worse ending songs than this. However, for an album consisting mostly of excellent songs with just a few slight misfires, Vital Signs is surprisingly lackluster. Again, I have to give credit where credit is due. It's clear that Rush put plenty of effort into making Vital Signs stand out from the rest. There are lots of unique ideas in this song. The problem is that most of them just don't work for me. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would be into this song, so please take my opinions with a grain of salt. This is mostly a matter of personal preference. One weird thing about this song is the use of electronic percussion in the first section. I'm not sure if this was an artistic decision or simply a result of the inferior technology of the time, but the percussion sounds really fuzzy and mechanical. It doesn't really fit, and considering that Rush has such a virtuosic drummer, it's puzzling that they wouldn't use him until later. Also, the song is laced with reggae influence, particularly in the way that the guitar and the bass are arranged. 
I suppose this does help the song sound more unique and gives it a bit of a charm, but the thing is, the elements of reggae just clash with the electronic drums and the synthesizers. Also, there is a lack of technical moments on this song, which leaves certain parts feeling pretty shallow. The vocal melodies are decently catchy this time around, but because the instrumental is so lacking, it, the melodies don't really conjure up good memories when they get stuck in my head. Don't get me wrong, Vital Signs is a perfectly tolerable song, and it almost succeeds at being good. Unfortunately, due to its strange mixture of ideas that just don't quite work together, I have to give it a 5 out of 10. Despite its disappointing ending, Moving Pictures is still a great album overall. I wouldn't say that it's quite the untouchable gem that it's typically hailed as, but there are way too many excellent songs on it to deny its quality. When I average my scores for these songs, I get a 7.6 out of 10. I could just leave it there, but that's an awfully specific rating, and I still haven't considered this album's value as a whole. Depending on how these different songs come together to form a single product, my final rating could be a 7 or an 8. The songs on Moving Pictures are very stylistically diverse, which is definitely beneficial for its rating. From the various ways that the synthesizers texture the songs, to the refusal to use the same key twice, to the shifts in focus between the instruments and the vocals, to the unique ideas which are constantly presented in each and every new song, it Rush manages to completely avoid repeating itself while still keeping a consistent style. I also want to consider the order in which the tracks are presented. I'll say that Moving Pictures has a pretty nice structure throughout. It starts off with a catchy and accessible song, which introduces the style. The second song develops on its style and speeds things up a bit. The third song keeps up that energy, but takes things in a more unexpected direction. The fourth song is more of a calming interlude. The fifth song starts out pretty steady, but then it speeds up and goes through all sorts of epic twists and turns. The sixth song sort of winds things down in preparation for the finale. And then that finale winds things down even further, but still has a pretty dramatic ending. I mean, I don't like Vital Signs that much, but I suppose it was kind of a logical choice. I would personally put The Camera Eye at the end, but that's just because I think it's a better song, and you could just have that really long, epic song at the end to close things off. With all things considered, Moving Pictures easily earns an 8 out of 10. Since this is a newbie review, I'm also going to rate this album on a special scale designed to gauge how well it lives up to the hype. The lowest rating will be Gilded Garbage, and the highest rating will be True Classic, and every rating in between will be some degree of overrated. Since I really like Moving Pictures, but I don't love every song, love the album, or think that it's one of the greatest albums of all time or anything close to that, I'm going to say it is somewhat overrated. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Newbie Reviews. There's definitely a lot more where this came from, but for now, I'm gonna go listen to some 2112. This is what I have to deal with. Meow.